on World News Tonight. She a dictator? US President Joe Biden, despite efforts made by Antony Blinken to lower tensions, calls his Chinese counterpart a dictator. What repercussions does this hold? Find out tonight. Time is running out. Underwater noises detected by the Canadian Royal Air Force at the bottom of the Atlantic as experts warn that there's only 40 hours of oxygen remaining in the submarine. Raising terrorists. Palestine and the Hamas rejoice and praises the militants who carried out an armed attack in Israel's West Bank, killing dozens. New Louis these. Clap along if you feel as Pharrell Williams unveils his latest Louis Vuitton lineup with the presence of Lewis Hamilton, Jaden Smith, and Beyonce. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Well, good evening, and you are watching World News. We're opening tonight with the newest developments of Blinken's rare visit to Beijing. U.S. President Joe Biden called Xi Jinping a dictator a day after top U.S. diplomat Antony Blinken visited Beijing to stabilize bilateral relations that China says are at their lowest point since formal ties were established. The U.S. pressed its call for military communication channels with China and signaled concern over reports that China plans a military training facility in Cuba following Secretary of State Antony Blinken's trip to Beijing. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said on Tuesday that he voiced concerns to his counterparts in China during a rare trip to Beijing about China's military activities in Cuba. He made very clear that we would have deep concerns about uh, PRC intelligence or military uh, activities in Cuba. And we will protect our homeland. We will protect our interests. The Wall Street Journal reported on Tuesday that China and Cuba are negotiating to establish a joint military training facility on the island that could lead to the stationing of Chinese troops just 100 miles off Florida's coast. Speaking at a press conference in London after his trip to Beijing, Blinken said he pressed for opening military communication channels with China. Uh, President Biden sent me to Beijing because he believes strongly that both the United States and China have an obligation to manage our relationship responsibly. And that starts with strengthening lines of communication. During Blinken's visit to Beijing earlier this week, the first by U.S. Secretary of State since 2018, the nations agreed to temper rivalries to avoid conflict, but there were no breakthroughs. I think both countries um, see the uh, importance of trying to bring more stability to the relationship. A lack of open channels between both nations has prompted international jitters, with Beijing's reluctance to engage in regular military-to-military -military talks with Washington alarming China's neighbors. In Beijing, the two sides appeared entrenched over a multitude of issues, from Taiwan to trade, including U.S. actions toward China's chip industry, plus human rights, and Russia's war against Ukraine, to which China maintains an impartial response. President Biden said from the outset of Russia's aggression against Ukraine that we would stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. Blinken also said on Tuesday that he would announce a new and robust U.S. assistance package for Ukraine on Wednesday at a conference in London aimed at encouraging private companies to invest in the country's reconstruction after Russia's invasion. Now, staying in Paris, President Yoon also sat down with his French counterpart, Emmanuel Macron. The two leaders agreed on closer cooperation on North Korean threats and the war in Ukraine. Well, President Yoon sung yeol may be in Paris to promote Busan's bid for the 2030 World Expo. Top of his agenda when meeting his French counterpart, Emmanuel Macron, was security and economic cooperation. Before his VIE presentation on Tuesday local time, Yoon and Macron kicked off the summit by addressing the media on their plans. France will support South Korea in order to resolutely respond to North Korean nuclear threats based on a common commitment under international law to achieve complete, verifiable and irreversible denuclearization. We will continue to firmly condemn the obvious violation of human rights. Yoon also touted France's efforts to restore peace in Ukraine and vowed to actively work with the international community to bring peace to the country and help with its restoration. 
The leaders also exchanged ideas on economic cooperation, especially on advanced technology during the summit, saying there are areas where the two countries have strengths but have yet to work together on. We will cooperate so that South Korea's new space agency can work with France's National Space Center, which is the third or fourth best in the world. This includes space exploration and satellite use. Also, as France has 56 nuclear power plants in operation, we will expand cooperation in small modular reactors, next-generation nuclear power, regulations and decommissioning plants. According to an official at the top office, Yoon also spoke to Macron about mitigating the effects of EU's trade laws on South Korean companies. They also discussed cooperation in diversifying the supply chain and moving away from dependence on one country for certain imports. In the meantime, President Yoon also met with young entrepreneurs from South Korea and France at Station F, known as the world's biggest startup campus, and discussed using innovation as a force for overcoming challenges and crises facing the world. Yoon said endless innovation based on freedom and solidarity is needed to overcome such challenges. And saying the future generation needs to arm themselves with innovative minds rooted in liberalism and internationalism, Yoon vowed, support from the South Korean government, no matter where they're from. Nine men charged over the worst shipwreck in the Mediterranean Sea this year denied any wrongdoing in court, while Pakistan started collecting DNA samples to help Greece identify some of its victims. Let's take a look. Rows of families are queuing up for DNA tests in Pakistan to help identify victims half a world away in Greece. At least 82 people are now confirmed to have died off the Greek coast in last week's tragic shipwreck. Most of them were from Egypt, Syria and Pakistan and had paid thousands of dollars to people traffickers. Mohammed Ayyub fears his brother may be among the dead. Cradling his nephew on his lap, he says there is widespread unemployment in the area and many people want to go abroad. The family was being tested in the hilltop town of Karata in the Pakistan-administered Himalayan region of Kashmir. Authorities there say they know at least 28 people who are either confirmed dead or missing in the disaster. Another person desperate for answers is Mohammed Aslam. He says his 26-year-old son had sent him a voice message on June the 8th, saying he was sitting in the ship. His voice told me he was worried. He sounded worried because he said some people with him had been there for months, up to six months. There were no arrangements for water or food. Nine suspected smugglers appeared in a Greek court on Tuesday to respond to charges that included manslaughter and migrant smuggling. The men, all from Egypt and aged between 20 and 40 years, denied any wrongdoing. Greece, which has come under increasing scrutiny over its response to the disaster, is still searching the sea in the wider area, though the chance of finding more survivors is seen as virtually nil. Palestinian gunmen killed four people in a shooting attack near an Israeli settlement in the occupied West Bank in an attack the Palestinian terrorist Hamas group said was a response to a raid by Israeli forces a day earlier in the flashpoint city of Jenin. The following visuals of this story is graphic. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. Friends and relatives mourn for a victim of the shooting carried out by Palestinian gunmen in the Jewish-occupied West Bank Tuesday that left at least four people dead and four more injured. Emergency services say the gunmen opened fire at a roadside restaurant and gas station. The militant Hamas group claimed responsibility for the shooting and said the two gunmen were members of its armed wing. Israeli authorities say one gunman was shot dead by a civilian at the scene and the second by Israeli security forces, who tracked him down after he fled the area. Israel's police minister has now urged Jewish settlers in the area to arm themselves with weapons, and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the, quote, score would be settled. Everyone who hurt us is either in the grave or in prison, so it will be here as well. Hamas said the attack was a response to a deadly Israeli raid a day earlier in the flashpoint city of Jenin. 
Israel used helicopter gunships on Monday in an hours-long gun battle that appeared to be some of the worst violence in the West Bank in months. The firefights killed six Palestinians, including a teenager, and left more than 90 Palestinians wounded. The West Bank has seen a sharp increase in violence over the past 15 months. Israel has stepped up its raids as violence surged between Israeli settlers and Palestinians. U.S. brokered peace talks between Israel and the Palestinians collapsed in 2014 and show no sign of revival. A Canadian aircraft detected underwater noises in the search area for a missing tourist submersible that vanished while taking passengers on a voyage to the wreck of the Titanic in deep waters off Canada's coast. Despite this, all predictions lead to the final factor that the chances of anyone surviving this incident is close to zero. American and Canadian authorities say they've expanded their search and rescue teams into deeper waters as they race against the clock to find the missing submersible that vanished while taking tourists on a $250,000 trip under the sea to the wreck of the Titanic. And learning more about the people aboard the vessel, which authorities say can only operate for about 96 hours underwater. Contact was lost on Sunday, and it's not clear what condition the vessel is in. So who is aboard? Hamish Harding, a British billionaire, is believed to be aboard and said on social media that he was one of the mission's specialists. He lives in Dubai and is the chairman of an aviation consultancy. He's an adventurer. He once accompanied Buzz Aldrin, the former astronaut, on a trip to the South Pole when Aldrin became the oldest person ever to reach the Antarctic. Yannicka Mickelson is a friend of Harding and a fellow explorer. I'm nervous. I'm sick to my stomach with nerves. I'm terrified. I'm anxious. I'm not sleeping at the moment. Um, I'm just hoping for good news. Every single second, every single minute feels like hours. Um, and we're losing time and we're losing opportunity to find them alive. I last spoke to Hamish right before his dive. He casually just wrote that he's on his way to the Titanic and he's waiting for the perfect weather window. And me, in an equally casual way, just answered, Godspeed, Hamish, and left it at that because he's always exploring. And I didn't consider that this type of expedition would be as dangerous as it's turned out to be. Four years ago, he was also aboard an aircraft that set a world record for fastest circumnavigation of the Earth over the North and South Pole. One of the missing persons is reportedly Stockton Rush, the founder of a company called OceanGate, which ran the operation, met Rush in 2017, where he talked about the company. This is what he said at the time. Five individuals can go on each dive. Uh, three of those are what we call mission specialists. So those are the folks who help finance the mission, um, but they are also active participants. So why we, we're not a fan of the tourist term is because these are crew members, and we teach them uh, you know, how to operate the sonar, how to operate the communication systems. You, you're part of the crew. Two others aboard are Shahzada Dawood and his son Suleiman. Dawood is an executive at one of Pakistan's largest conglomerates, Engro Corporation, and lives in the UK. But he's also a trustee at the famed SETI Institute, also known as the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence in California. Their website says he's a philanthropist, loves animals, and has a wife and daughter as well. Je suis uh, Paul Henri Narjolet. The vessels reportedly piloted by Paul-Henri Narjolet, a French explorer and the director of underwater research at a company that owns the wreck of the Titanic. He's a former commander in the French Navy and served as both a diver and minesweeper. He was also on the first recovery expedition to the Titanic in 1987. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. 
Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said that a Canadian Air Force helicopter crashed into Ottawa River, killing two armed force members and two others on board have been recovered and are in hospital. The crash of the Royal Canadian Air Force CH-147 Chinook helicopter happened near a military base in Petawawa, northwest of the capital of Ottawa in Ontario, just after midnight. Trudeau said there will be an investigation into the crash. In 2020, a Canadian helicopter crashed into the Mediterranean Sea off the coast of Greece, killing six. Four Canadian Armed Forces personnel were on board the CH-147 Chinook at the time, according to a tweet from Anita Anand, Minister of National Defence. Speaking to reporters, Trudeau said he spoke to Chief of the Defence Staff, General Wayne Eyre, overnight and conferred his condolences. Neither military nor defence officials have confirmed any crew members were killed or are presumed dead. Defence officials said that search and recovery efforts are ongoing. Renfrew County paramedics said Said it treated two patients with non-life-threatening injuries who were then taken to hospital. Two missing crew members are from 450 Tactical Helicopter Squadron, according to a news release from DND. The military says this type of helicopter is used to move people and equipments, and this squadron is based out of Petawawa. U.S. President Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, has agreed to plead guilty to two charges of willfully failing to pay income taxes and to enter an agreement that could enable him to avoid a conviction on a gun-related charge. U.S. President Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, has agreed to plead guilty to federal income tax charges in a deal with the Justice Department. That's according to government documents and a statement from Hunter Biden's attorney on Tuesday. It reads, quote, Hunter Biden believes it is important to take responsibility for these mistakes he made during a period of turmoil and addiction in his life. He looks forward to continuing his recovery and moving forward. The charges against Hunter Biden arose from an investigation by the U.S. attorney in the Democratic president's home state of Delaware. That U.S. attorney was appointed by Republican former President Donald Trump. I think Hunter Biden is a disgrace. Hunter Biden was getting money from corrupt oligarchs. Hunter Biden got rich in the Ukraine. The 53-year-old Hunter Biden has for years been the focus of unrelenting attacks by Trump and his Republican allies. They have accused him of peddling his access to his father when Joe Biden was vice president to win business deals in Ukraine and China. Joe Biden assured the American people that he had never spoken to his son about his overseas business dealing. Both Hunter Biden and his father have denied the accusations of corruption. According to the deal, the president's son also entered a pretrial diversion agreement on one firearm offense. Hunter Biden has worked as a lobbyist, a lawyer, an investment banker, and an artist, and has publicly detailed his struggles with substance abuse. A White House statement on Tuesday said President Biden supports his son and his efforts to rebuild his life and had no comment on the charges. Now, following Poland's agreement to purchase dozens of South Korea's F-A-50 fighter jets, the European nation has sent its pilots to South Korea to master the new planes. Clear for takeoff. Flying high in the skies above Yecheon with the South Korean aircraft TA-50 are pilots not from South Korea but from Poland. Last year, Poland penned a deal with Korea Aerospace Industries to buy 48 of their fighter jets, the F-A-50. With the new fleet comes a need for a fresh set of skills to fly these aircraft. And that's why these Polish pilots are here. With four months of rigorous training, they've graduated from the trainer versions of the F-A-50, the unarmed T-50 and the more advanced T-A-50. The pilots have been tested in simulated missions to better prepare them for combat situations. The complex training required a high level of communication and cooperation from both the Korean and Polish pilots. We've trained to showcase South Korea's superior flight system and domestic jets globally. We hope our FA-50 PL and training contributes to Poland's air defense. The Polish pilots were particularly impressed by the Korean jet's ergonomic design, swift acceleration and responsive maneuverability. But what they've gained in South Korea extends beyond new flight skills. Friendships have been forged and cultures exchanged. Polish pilot team uh, received not only uh, new flight skills in Korea, but also uh, discovered some kind of incredible uh, Korean culture. Uh, um, 
many, many of the opportunity to uh, find out some kind of uh, new, new things in Korea. As Poland expects its first F-A-50 jets to undergo flight tests in July and be delivered to Warsaw in August, these pilots are expected to be home in time for those jets' arrival. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world together. Britain's King Charles hosted state officials, including U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and diplomats at St. James Palace, ahead of Ukraine Recovery Conference in London, for which more than 1,000 foreign officials from over 60 states, along with business chiefs and global investors, are set to attend. Controversial influencer Andrew Tate has been charged in Romania with rape, human trafficking and forming an organized crime group to sexually exploit women. His brother Tristan Tate and two associates also face charges. All have denied the allegations. Germany has officially presented the mascot for the 2024 UFL European Football Championship. According to the UFO website, the mascot pays homage to the popular children's teddy bear toy, which is said to have originated in Germany in the early 20th century. Glaciers in Asia's Hindukush Himalaya could lose up to 75% of their volume by centuries end due to global warming, causing both dangerous flooding and water shortages for the 240 million people who live in the mountainous region. The Lebanese women's national basketball team is training hard in preparation for the prestigious Women's Asia Cup in Sydney, Australia later this month. They hope to raise spirits of their country, which has been decimated by a financial crisis. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can always rewatch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other there in English. We finally end off in Paris, where record producer and singer Pharrell Williams drew his audience to the point of New Bridge in Paris, kicking off his tenure as creative director of menswear for the fashion brand with a celebrity-packed outdoor show. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.